Welcome to another episode of the Innovation Insights Podcast, where we explore innovation in all aspects of life. I'm your host, Dr. Yolanda Sanders. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Tamika Ellington, a remarkable figure whose journey of triumph over adversity is nothing short of inspirational. Dr. Ellington's story begins in the inner city of Cleveland, Ohio. Her impressive credentials include a Bachelor's of Art in Fashion from Kent State University, a Master's of Art in Apparel and Textile Design from Michigan State University, and a PhD in Curriculum and Instruction from Kent State University. Her professional journey has been equally remarkable, starting as a fashion designer for major corporations and then transitioning into academia. At Kent State University, she made history as the first Black professor in the fashion school. And then her role also included assistant dean for the College of Arts and director for diversity initiatives. An internationally acclaimed fashion designer, a fashion scholar, speaker, and confidence coach, Dr. Ellington is the CEO and founder of Dr. Tamika Ellington Enterprises. She is a published author with her books like Textures, The History and Art of Black Hair, are making significant contributions to Black TV and culture discourse. Her latest book, Black Hair in a White World, continues this critical conversation. Dr. Ellington's dedication to empowering others especially breaking down cultural barriers and fostering self-confidence is truly transformative. Her story is a testament to the power of self-empowerment in supporting innovation. So join us as we dive into an engaging conversation with the inspiring Dr. Tamika Ellington. Welcome to Innovation Insights. Thank Dr. you so Ellington. much. Thank you so much. I'm honored to do this interview with you. I'm excited about it. Thank you for the invitation. Well, I'm a fan of yours. I have been for a long time and I've had the opportunity to work with you and watch your success professionally in many areas. And so I'm so proud to have you here and for you to share with us your wisdom because there is so much that you have. Thank you. I, I mean, it's for me to be interviewed by you and for you to say all these wonderful things about me just lets me know that I'm doing something right. You starting off as a mentor to me in the industry was a big part, played a big part in my success. So I thank you. Oh, that's, that's very, very kind of you. Wow, that's very kind of you. We're lucky to have you. We are thank lucky you. to have you in this world. So let's, let's start, start with your journey. journey. Okay. Could you talk about growing up in Cleveland and then working in industry and then becoming a fashion scholar and then now you work with your own business? Yeah, yeah. The journey has been just that. Uh, I grew up in the inner city of Cleveland uh, to a single mom who had me when she was 16. She had my brother when she was 17 and then had my sister when she was 21. And unfortunately, my dad was not with us. He was addicted to alcoholism. He was an alcoholic, dealt with alcoholism, which eventually turned into drugs and then which eventually led him into a prison sentence. So my dad was in prison for about 15 years. One of the things that was critically important to me as a young person was to not repeat what I saw. That was one of the things that I really strive to do. And I think that has been the catalyst of pretty much everything that I've done is to not repeat what I saw growing up and that I could do something different than what I saw growing up. And so I became the first person in my family to go and actually graduate from high school. So I'm a first generation high school graduate as well as a first generation college graduate. And when I went on to the, into the fashion industry, became one of the first people in my family to work in a corporate environment. You know, my family is very blue collar family and it's been an absolute journey. And one of the things that I will say is that I had to learn how to be flexible in my journey. I thought 
I was going to be a fashion designer for the rest of my life. That's what I thought. God had other plans for me. He kept whispering things in my ear. And I just, you know, I, you know, I had to just go and follow what it was. And when I was working at Abercrombie, I was a technical designer at Abercrombie. And when I was working there, I loved what I was doing. I love working for Abercrombie. It was such an amazing experience being there. But I kept feeling like I was missing something. And that little piece of me missing something is what ended me up like going to school, back to school for my PhD and uh, starting my teaching journey, becoming an educator. And then once I became an educator, that was my sweet spot. I got a chance to do fashion as well as to fulfill my soul at the same time. And my students ended up letting me know that I was doing more than just teaching them. They began to send me these beautiful cards. Like at the end of the semester, I would get these beautiful notes. The students would say things like, Dr. Ellington, you really helped me increase my level of self-esteem, or I saw how hard you work and you made me want to work harder. I saw, like they would just say all these beautiful things. Like you just, the kids would say, you inspire me so much. And when I realized that I'm like, wow, I'm not only teaching, but I'm empowering these students. And that feeling of being able to have the ability to empower others overtook me. It overtook me. And my students, I actually talked to them before I left the university. Um, I was in class, my very last class, because I was about to switch over into the dean's office. And my last class, I told my students, I said, I'm thinking about becoming a full-time speaker. I'm a little bit apprehensive about it, but I think that might be where I'm going next. And my students, they were like, oh, you would be so good at that, Dr. Ellingson. I can definitely see you doing that. And my response back to them was, if I go and become a speaker, then I won't be able to be in class with you all anymore. And one of my students stood up and she said, if you leave, You'll have a global classroom. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> so they gave me permission to leave. Mm, that's wonderful. And I started on the journey of uh, becoming a motivational speaker, empowerment coach. I work a lot with women, helping them increase their level of confidence and things like that and le building leadership skills and things. And so I just, I love it. I absolutely love it. I do miss my students. I miss being mm -hmm. in class with my students for sure, mm -hmm. but I'm on a new journey now. You are. So. Well, I follow I you on social media, media and I, I see that you're with yeah, you're engaging with so many different people. So your students, yeah. your student was correct. Yeah. And you have a, a global classroom. So how was that transition? Because you don't hear leaving academia and going out on their own and uh, very entrepreneurial and innovative to do that. Yeah. Um, the transition was a courageous feat. When I left the university, I didn't really tell a whole lot of people that I was leaving and what I was going to be doing. I told just a handful of people, and it was mostly people that I felt like I could trust. And even some of those individuals, like one of my colleagues, who was a good friend of mine, I had mentioned to her a while back that I wanted to start a business. And then once I became dean, she said to me, Oh, now that you're assistant dean, you don't have to start that little business that you were talking about. And I said, okay, I see that I won't be able to talk to you about this anymore. You know? And so I did not want to hear other people's opinions about what I was going to do. And so I stopped telling people what I was doing. Only the people that needed to know were the ones that knew. And so when I made the transition, it was really hard because... By this time, I'm doing well, making six figures and a stable job. Most people, that's the job that they aim for. I was in a, I was in a job that people aim to get. And for me to walk away from that took a lot of courage. And then not only did I have to end up walking away from my career in academia, but I also ended up having to walk away from my marriage too. 
um, my my ex husband wasn't thrilled about me leaving the university and starting my own business and doing all these things. And so I had to make a choice. Was I going to do what I knew God was asking me to do? Or was I going to do what my ex-husband wanted me to do? And so I chose God. Very courageous. And uh, taking really big courageous steps. So So you've talked quite a bit about education and empowerment. What's your thoughts about mentorship and how are you providing mentorship now to uh, this global classroom that you have? I'm a huge advocate for mentorship. All of the success that I've had, even from being a young girl, I could attribute my success to people that mentored me throughout my years. I had a Sunday school teacher, Miss Carol who she was an amazing person, an amazing mentor. I had a very difficult high school experience. By this time, my dad was in prison and we were going through a lot of things at home. And Miss Carol was such an amazing part, such an amazing part of my life. And then when I got to college, I met professors that were amazing that helped me along my journey. When I became a professional, I established an executive board of mentors. You were included in that. And I had mentors to help me with lots of different parts of my life. I mentored several students, and I still do. I have a scholarship that I left with the university. It was really important for me, especially as the first Black professor in the school to leave some form of a legacy. And I started the Ellington Foundation and I give scholarships to students every year. I've been doing that now for the past three years. And I stay in touch with my students and I'm accessible to them whenever they need to talk or whatever the case might be. I want to make sure that I'm accessible. That's wonderful. I know some other individuals that sponsor some scholarships too that give the money but also give the time Mm -hmm. and the access to their support and knowledge and it's just a double win for the the student that receives the scholarship absolutely yeah i mean and it's my it's my pleasure um and my honor to be able to do it because people did it for me i'm sorry i don't know where these tears are coming from oh that's okay that's okay that's okay. Maybe I feel comfortable enough with you to cry. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's what it is. Oh, yeah. We've been through some journeys. <laughs> yes, we have. Yes, we absolutely have. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, reflecting and preparing for this or speaking back to some of our past conversations. And sometimes I was in Colorado working in my yard talking with you. <laughs> no. Yeah, some really good, good memories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, now one big area that you work in is beauty and yeah. challenging Western, Western beauty standards. Absolutely. Uh, especially in the context of black beauty and hair. Yeah. Uh, uh, share with us how that became important to you uh, as a topic of focus. Um, It's been important that the topic of Black beauty has been important to me ever since I was a child because uh, I grew up with dark brown skin, with kinky hair, Um, and I would notice in school the little girls that would get the boyfriends and the ones that wouldn't get the boyfriend. I would notice the treatment, you know, how they were treated versus how I was treated. As I grew into a young adult, I ended up um, going to work for an amusement park. And while we were in orientation, they were telling us all about our uniform, what we had to wear. And then they started telling us what we couldn't come to work wearing. So back then, you couldn't have a lot of tattoos. You couldn't have a lot of piercings. You couldn't have crazy colors in your hair. And then they started talking about 
we couldn't wear afros. They started talking about we couldn't wear braids. We couldn't wear locks. And that puzzled me so much because I'm like, okay, these are hairstyles that Black people wear on a normal basis. Like, why can't we come to work with these kinds of hairstyles? And at the time, I was in the process of transitioning from being a woman who straightened her hair to being a woman who had natural hair. So I've been natural ever since 98. Um, and I was at the time when I was working for this amusement park, I was wearing my hair like in a little afro. And so I'm like, okay, so are they telling me that I can't come to work looking like this? And needless to say, I didn't stay there for longer than four weeks or so. And then I was back at home. But just trying to better understand myself as a Black woman, trying to understand why society has such a disdain with Black beauty, why we as Black people have such a disdain with Black beauty. I wanted to understand all of that. And so that's what got me started on the journey. When I was a student at Michigan State, I worked under a wonderful lady, Sally Halvinston. And uh, Dr. Halvinston was very, very um, open with me in regards to selecting my thesis topic. And I told her, I said, you know, the only thing I really want to study is black hair. I said, that's the only thing that's really important to me. And she said, oh, 